habits, right? These things that you, you want to become second nature in your life because if they do become second nature in your life, then there's some really good things that become results that you experience in your life. As I was thinking about this series, that I was reminded when I was in high school, I had this beautiful, rusty, beat up, smelled like gasoline every time you drove it, Ford Mustang. And it, I think it cost my parents $500, which explained its exterior and interior and functionality. But it most of the time got me from A to B. So this was my first car. I remember one day I, I called my stepdad after school because I couldn't get the car to go into gear. It just it wasn't. I would put it in reverse. Nothing was happening. And I was like, I, I need you. And he was really just handy with cars. So he got off work and he showed up at the school. He gets in the car. And the first thing he does is he cranks the car. And it's amazing what happens when you actually crank the car. You can actually shift it into gear. So this whole time, I'm panicking, I'm frustrated, I think the whole car is broken. And all I've done is, see, you can, you can actually turn the key enough to where all the electricity turns on in the car, but the engine isn't running. And that's what I had done. And uh, it's funny enough because that moment marked me, maybe because he makes fun of me every Thanksgiving for it. Um, but it marked me. So now that I have two drivers in my house, uh, ironically, even in the past seven days, there's been experiences where I've gotten a phone call as a dad where it said, Dad, the car won't do this. And I say, did you crank it or did you just turn it on? And they're like, well, let me check. Sure enough, if you actually crank the car, most of the things work. And so there's something that we can learn from that, that sometimes there's a, a question you need to ask. If something's not working, have I really turned it all on yet? And this leads me to one of the dimensions of a disciple, one of the aspects of a disciple of Jesus that is so key because I feel like without it, we are missing, there's, there's certain parts of our Christian journey that we're just like, it just won't go into gear. I'm trying to head that direction, but it's just not working how I think it's supposed to work. In fact, this was a, a thing that shaped the early apostles when they were going throughout and sharing the gospel and, and starting churches. And there was just this amazing just revival of people coming to know the Lord. And Christianity was growing just leaps and bounds, thousands and thousands upon thousands of people getting saved. There was one question, kind of like my question, hey, did you, did you actually crank the car? There was one question that they were asking that, that apparently was so key to Christianity that they wanted to make sure that there was no question of whether someone had experienced this. And so we, we see this question really on display in Acts chapter 19 when Paul is on his journey to another city to tell people about Christ. The, Paul had, in this very, very dramatic way, experienced Christ uh, after persecuting Christians. And then he spent three years with the apostles, making sure he was like getting, getting his mind right, in a way probably proving that he wasn't going to murder more Christians, you know, all these kinds of things. And then he gets sent out. And when he gets sent out, there, there's, there's a mission, and there's a goal, and he wants to make sure not only do people know Jesus, but is the car running? Are they getting the full functionality of what they're meant to experience? And it's interesting, the question that is on the forefront of Paul's mind. In Acts chapter 19 Verses 1 and 2, it says this, while Apollos was at Corinth, so he's another leader in the church world at that time, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? 
I think this is interesting. He found some disciples. First question. First question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? First questions show you what's valuable, what's important. Paul's telling us a lot by just letting us in on the first question that he had for these disciples. And it's interesting the way that they answered because I think it's not that uncommon even today. They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul is in this moment. He's, he's kind of in this scenario. Maybe he's prepared for it. I don't know. But he's going in. He meets someone and is going, yeah, but did you, did you crank the car? Like, have you, have you gotten the Holy Spirit? And their response is, we don't even, like, you speak speaking a foreign language to us, Paul. We, we've not even heard of this. So what does he do next? Like, does he be like, oh, well, do a little research, come back and visit me. You know, like, like what's, he, what's he do? Like, but there's something burning inside of him that knows that there is something so essential to being a disciple of Jesus and your relationship with the Holy Spirit, that he leans in, he presses in, and he finds out something really interesting. In verse 3, this is how it continues. It says, so Paul asked them, well, then what baptism did you receive? They said, John's baptism, they replied. And this let Paul know something. These were disciples, but they weren't disciples of Jesus. They were simply disciples of John. John had gone and preached before Jesus had started his ministry and had called people to turn their hearts towards God, to follow follow God. And so these were God-fearing people. But they hadn't encountered the revelation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what they would do to their life. So Paul's recognizing something real quick. Wait a second. Okay. Whoa, I may have jumped the gun. I may have jumped the gun. I was asking you like a follow-up question to you being a disciple of Jesus. But let me rewind the tape a little bit. We got to get you to be a disciple of Jesus to begin with, right? And so he says, listen, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So obviously we're getting a a summary here of this conversation at this point. uh, Because they would have had to find water and have a whole baptismal moment. Uh, But it continues, after they were baptized, it says, When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So a pretty traumatic, or not traumatic, dramatic, pretty spectacular moment happens for these these people. They've been following John's leadership, repented, devoted their lives to God. And now in this moment, they've they've converted to going, you know what, I'm not just going to be a disciple to John's teachings, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ himself. Because Paul, I mean, because John said it was Jesus that was the one that we were supposed to follow. So they become a disciple of Jesus, and then Paul goes back to his original question. But have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Because there's some things that You're meant to experience that come through the gift of the Holy Spirit being active in your life. I want you to understand today that disciples of Jesus should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, you can tell from this story and from many other stories in the book of Acts that this is a separate experience from salvation. And, and there's, there's plenty of teachings you can get on the Motion app and, and just search the word Holy Spirit in the search category uh, in the messages and find all the messages I've taught on the Holy Spirit uh, to, to talk about this distinction between receiving the Holy Spirit when you're saved and being baptized in the Holy Spirit as a separate experience. 
But it's clear in this moment that that's what is happening. Paul's going, yes, you disciple, but you need to be baptized. You need to be fully immersed. You need to, you need to experience what it's like when the Holy Spirit has control instead of you having control. It leads me to this question. If this is such an essential thing for the Apostle Paul, then what am I going to experience today that I'm meant to encounter with the strength that the Holy Spirit is meant to provide? Like, what kind of decision am I going to make today that I should, I should have the discernment and direction of the Holy Spirit to help me make that decision? What kind of moment am I going to encounter today that maybe in my own strength and in my own power, I'm going to feel insecure in that moment if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit's presence empowering me for it? It makes me go like, what am I encountering on a day-to-day basis that I'm supposed to be depending on the Holy Spirit to help me in? And, and am I letting that happen? Because this is supposed to be a normal part of a disciple of Jesus' life. That walking with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. That, that there's some, some functions that, of the car that can work by, by, by getting saved. But there's a, there's a part of living daily that we're meant to experience this, this gift. Of the Holy Spirit in the driver's seat. So I wonder why, I wonder why, you know, for, for Paul, his encounter, they said, we haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. I would say there's some in the world and even in the church world today, they go, I haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. There's some, I would say, that would go, I've heard about the Holy Spirit, but I, I, I just... All I've heard is when you get saved, you, you got the Holy Spirit. It just, it's, like a, it's like a thing. It's like you got a shot. Now you got the Holy Spirit. Right? When I was an infant, I got a bunch of shots, and now I got them. And now I can like, go to college because I got my shots. Right? I got the Holy Spirit, and so I can kind of do this thing. And so there's just a lot of lack of knowledge there. But also I think that with it, we... We have this wrestling because if we aren't careful, we want a Christianity that we can control. I know that's where I was for, for many years in my faith is I like to, I like to know how things are going to go. I like to be the one driving the car. I like to make decisions. I like to, I like, I like to control the scenario, but yet there's something about going But Holy Spirit, I want you to be the one that's doing the leading in my life. I gotta release, I gotta release some of this. I think in a way, it's almost like we've we've fallen in love with the packaging, God's grace, that is so beautiful and so amazing and draws us to God, that we've we've forgotten the value of the actual thing that's under the wrapping paper which is this intimate relationship with God that we are meant to have. God's grace is drawing us to that intimacy. I remember the first time I bought an iPhone. Anybody in here ever have an iPhone? Anybody? Any iPhone? Okay, the rest of y'all, y'all need to get saved. I'm just saying. Just saying. All right. They got to sell it somewhere. Some, just switch your phone plan. They'll get you hooked up, Okay. But I remember the first time I ever got an iPhone, and it, was a, it, was, it wasn't like the first one. Because the first one came out, I was like, who in the world is spending that kind of money on a phone? And now, for some reason, we all do, right? But I remember the first time I got an iPhone, and I got the box, and the box was impressive. Like, I, like, slid, like it took me an hour to figure out how to get it out, you know, get it out. And then I'm like, oh, wow, it's like, it's like slow motion unpacking. You're just like, you don't want to like, it's supposed to be unbreakable, but you're like taking it out gently, peeling plastic off. And then you're like, man, this thing, like, I was so impressed with the packaging that it felt wrong to throw it in the trash. Like, I, like I kept it. 
I don't know what I was going to do with it because I wasn't going to put the phone back in the packaging. But I was like, I just, the packaging so impressive that it feels like, feels like 50% of what I paid for was this box. I think that some of us have missed the reality that God's grace is so amazing so that we will open and see what else he has in store. Not that we throw away his grace. We never should graduate his grace. We should wake up every day going his mercies are new every morning. We should every day be fully aware of his grace that's been extended to our lives. But his grace has been extended to our lives so that we can step into the fullness of relationship with him. And that relationship with him is cultivated through the Holy Spirit. God's presence with us. God's presence with us. So if a disciple is meant to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, immersed in the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, then we have to, one, see the value of that, and two, cultivate habits that allow us daily to lean on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. One of the things I think that serves as a great picture for us to see the value of living a Spirit-led life is to look at Jesus himself. When he was baptized, it says the Holy Spirit came on him. And then there's some things that happened right afterwards that give us a picture into the work of the Holy Spirit in his life and the work of the Holy Spirit is it's meant to be in our lives. Everything Jesus did was for us, but it was also in many ways to model it for us. And so you look, Luke chapter 3, uh, verse 21, you see... This baptism moment that happens for Jesus. It says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Now, I think I've shared this with some of you before, but for the longest time, I always just imagined a dove flying down. And then it was like, I always say it's like, no, it was like a dove. So the Holy Spirit came. It was just gentle and graceful, you know, that kind of thing. It wasn't a white bird just flying down and landing on Jesus' shoulder. He's like a, <laughs> I don't even need to say all that. My mind, it's my imagination. I was going to say he was like a, a little pirate with a parrot on his shoulder. But I didn't say it, so you didn't, you didn't get that image. In, uh, but... But, but I, you know, when you're a kid, you imagine all kinds of things. But the Holy Spirit, it says, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit came down and rested on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased. And so at this moment, there's this very visible demonstration. One, this is a great moment where you understand that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three and yet they are one. They're, they're all God, but yet they are not uh, three uh, just versions of the same thing. They're all separate because you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all present in this one moment. But the Holy Spirit comes on Jesus in a very visible way because it is a picture to us that we need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and that there's some things that happen, right? Those small disciplines that bring big results. There's some things as we cultivate that relationship with the Holy Spirit that bring results into our life. And so one of the first things that you see in Jesus' life after the Holy Spirit comes on him is you see that the Holy Spirit brings direction. The Holy Spirit brings direction. Which is great because... Every day I need direction. Every day I need direction. I, I need to know whether to make this decision or to make that decision. I, I, I need to know how to handle my life, how to lead my family, how to, to carry myself at work. I need direction every single day. And the beauty is, is that God's given us his word, which is like a roadmap to many things. Everything that we need to know about God, everything we need to know about life, everything we need to know about sin is in his word. 
But yet whether I sell my house or don't sell my house and how much I should list it for, it's just not in the book of Ephesians. And the Holy Spirit is there for direction. The way it showed up in Jesus' life, it says in, in Luke 4, 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by the Spirit. In fact, you can see that phrase, led by the Spirit, all through the New Testament. It applied to Jesus' life, applied to Paul's life, it applied to all the disciples' life. They were led by the Spirit. It should be something that is true of our lives, that we were led by the Spirit. We showed up to work, and for some reason we were led by the Spirit to go a few cubicles over and say something to someone that we hardly ever talked to at the office. Led by the Spirit. We, 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 were, we were about to, to hire this one person, but all of a sudden there was a, a check in our spirit. The Holy Spirit's like, no, 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 that's not going to work out the way you think it, it's going to work out. And then you, you, you know to say no to that situation and that person. We're meant to be led by the Spirit. I think it's interesting that it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness because I can tell you this much, that's not anywhere I would have gone on my own. Right? I would have never been like, hey family, get ready. We're hopping in the car and heading to the middle of nowhere. Right? But it said the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Because the wilderness was a place that he needed to go. And we needed him to go. Because because he went to the wilderness, we know how to stand up against the attacks of the enemy. Because it was there that he was tempted. It's there that we learn that we can overcome temptation through the power of the Word of God active in our lives. Right? We know that he needed to go to the wilderness, but it never would have been a place that we would have chosen to go on our own. Like, I think about sometimes in my selfishness how I want the Spirit to lead me, right? Holy Spirit, let me wake up in the morning with five random numbers between one and like 45-ish, and they just happen to allow me to win millions of dollars. Spirit, lead me in that way, right? Spirit, you know, some of you are going, Spirit, lead me to where that, that handsome, young, single, godly man is. That's where I want you to lead me. we got all these places that we want to be led but there's something that happens that's very significant. When you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, He may lead you to places you never would have picked, but you would never change them in hindsight. It says in Isaiah 30, verse 21, what God's intention for us is, and the work of the Holy Spirit, is to be like this. It says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. This is how we're supposed to live the Christian life as disciples of Jesus. Allowing the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives. And the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life will show up in multiple different ways. Sometimes it's that, it's that, uh, that, that no that you can feel. Like you can, you can feel a yes and you can feel a no. Uh, you're like, oh, I think I'm about to do this. And then it's got kind of that danger feeling. If you were Spider-Man, you would have little things appear. You know, you'd be like, that's a no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to not do that. Or, you know what, I, feel, I just feel compelled to say this. I feel compelled to do this. I, I, this inner yes, this inner no. There's that, that quiet voice that... That speaks into your heart and into your mind. That, that I often equate it's just it's, a, it's another voice. That isn't me going crazy. Right? That, that's drawing me to something positive. That I wouldn't have thought of on my own. You, you see even in the Apostle Paul's life. Several occurrences where it said that he perceived things by the Holy Spirit. He perceived that when he was getting on a boat, 
to go on a journey that that boat was going to shipwreck and that most of the things on that boat were going to uh, fall into the ocean, but that they were going to be okay as long as they prayed. He perceived that. It's like the Lord showed him a picture of what was going to happen, which is one of the things that the Bible says the Holy Spirit will show us things to come, right? So there's, there's an aspect where the Holy Spirit gives us direction, and we need that. And we need to go, God, I don't, want, I don't want to be in control of my life. I think that's why the, the phrase baptized in the Holy Spirit is used, because it's like, when, you no, know, I'm fully immersed in you. Holy Spirit, you're leading me. So the Holy Spirit gives direction. Uh, I was on a trip, uh, a mission trip to Honduras with a group of people. And, and uh, one of my friends uh, on the trip, she would tell you, she said, you know, she, she's, she's Catholic. And she said, you know, as a Catholic, you just, you recite a lot of prayers. You don't actually pray a lot just naturally in your own words. You, you have a lot of written prayers and you say a lot of different prayers. We had this uh, thing happen the first day of the trip where we were wanting to buy school supplies for this school that we were going to. And a lot of the adults were coming to me. I was leading the trip. They were coming to me and they were saying, Hey, we need to, as soon as we get back from, you know, this place, we need to, we need to go and we need to get some school supplies. Well, I had that like... Holy Spirit just checked me and goes, you know, this is a great learning moment for all of these teenagers that are on the trip. Let's create a prayer moment to see what we need to do. And so we, we, we get back to the place we're staying, and I pull all everybody together. And I said, hey, we have this option. We can just go buy some school supplies today and take it to the school tomorrow and, and bless them. But I really think we're supposed to pray and ask the Lord. Because one, I want you to know that you can hear the voice of the Lord in your life. And two, I want to make sure we're doing what the Lord wants. And so we just pause for a moment and just ask a simple question. And this is a good exercise for you. Sometimes you just need to ask the Lord a simple question and then pause and wait for a simple answer to come. Maybe not simple because he's simple, but simple because we're simple, right? And so we just ask, Lord, are, are we supposed to get some school supplies today and, and, and take it to them tomorrow? We waited for about 60 seconds. I looked around. I said, hey, well, anybody feel like the Lord was saying? And, and just people started going, no, we're not supposed to do that today. We're supposed to wait. We need to do it later in the week when we aren't going to that school physically. They're like, we don't need to go and buy this stuff and show up and we get the glory because we brought all this stuff. Like, we just want to bless them, but we don't want to be seen when they're blessed. And, um, and so it's like, okay, well then what we'll do is then we'll just pray and go, okay, Lord, show us how to contribute to this. And I said it, they estimated about two or $300 worth of school supplies would bless all the kids in this school. And so just pray. If you want to help contribute to that, you can. And then by the end of the week, we'll just we'll give them the resources, that kind of thing. Well, later that week, I'm riding in the car with my friend that I was telling you about that she said, all I've ever really done is just read these, these prayers from this book. She said, something happened to me when we had that moment. She said, all of a sudden, she said, we started praying, and the Lord was like, you need to give $500. And she said, and I was like, um, what? <laughs> She said, she said, we had just spent thousands of dollars fixing our car. So we, we had just spent a ton of money on, on an issue that was an inconvenience. And I'm just going, Lord, I don't know. She said, but I immediately text my husband that was in the United States. And it's like, I feel like the Lord's telling us we need to give $500 to this. To which he's kind of thinking the same thing she's thinking. Like, well, this is a little crazy. Let's talk on the phone later tonight. Maybe just get excited about being in another country. She gets on the phone. He says, you know what? I'll pray about this. The next morning, he has a job where he, he has an agent that books him for different situations. And that morning he woke up, his agent had booked him for the largest uh, gig, basically, uh, of his career. And so he called her up. He said, I think we'll give the $500. I think the Lord's trying to build our faith. And by the end of the week, 
I tallied up all the money that just this small group of people during our mission trip had contributed, and it was over $1,600, that they were not only able to buy school supplies, but they were also being able to go towards fully funding a teacher that they couldn't afford for an entire grade. And we just sat there at the end of the week just like, Imagine if we just in our own strength and our own thoughts were like, oh, we need to go ahead and buy some school supplies because we're going to that school tomorrow. But because we allowed the Spirit to lead, one, we were able to get them more, and God got the glory for it, but also He was able to do so much in so many other people's lives. The Holy Spirit gives direction. The Holy Spirit also brings power. It says this of Jesus. It says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Everything we saw Jesus do in his ministry was done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was showing us this is the same way that we should be. Because even when he was going to ascend to heaven to prepare a place for us, he looked at his disciples in Acts 1.8 and he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Everything people should see us do in our lives should be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our prayer every day, God, fill me with your spirit fresh and anew today. So that I can step into the moments that you have for me. My, my, part of one of my daily declarations is, God, I'm filled with your spirit, so allow the gifts of your spirit to flow through me today. The Holy Spirit also brings purpose. Luke 4, 18, Jesus gets to Galilee. He walks into the, the temple there, the, the tabernacle, the synagogue is the word I'm looking for. And he grabs the scroll and he stands up in front of him. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Anointed, set apart for a purpose. Jesus was uniquely anointed. But the Bible is also clear that the Holy Spirit uniquely anoints you as well. One of the things I love about our Next Steps class called Launch is we just intentionally, our Next Steps team, just takes some intentional time to go, let's look at how God naturally gifted you. Because that shows a lot, right? You just look at how any person that created anything, uh, there's some intentionality of what the purpose of it is, is if you just look at it. And then we go, but then let's look at what the Holy Spirit's gifting you for. And when we look at those things, all of a sudden purpose for your life starts to get a little more clear. Yeah, I may have this career, but in that career, this is my unique touch. And this is what I get to bring to that place that I am. So where even, wherever you find yourself knowing that the Holy Spirit in His power and His strength and His direction will give you purpose where you are. So what do we do? What do we do? I think we go back to some of the actions that led to Jesus living this spirit-led example for us. If you go to Matthew 3.13, it says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John didn't pursue Jesus. Jesus went there. He was proactive. Disciples make it a habit to pursue. Make it a habit daily to pursue God. Pursue the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not a side project. It's not just a Sunday morning activity. But I wake up daily and I pursue. God, I want more of you. And not just more of you for me, but more of you to flow through me. I remember this past Wednesday night, our worship night, 
uh, we had a moment where different people were coming up and praying and uh, Aaron Bayer got up and, and she, she prayed this prayer and I wrote it down in my notes something to the effect of God sent let me, I gotta pull it out I, just, I don't want to say it wrong place us in the middle of someone else's pain God can do that anywhere you go to school, anywhere you go to work, anywhere you live. God can place you in the middle of someone else's pain. God, I pursue you, and I want you to use me right where I am. In Luke 3, 21, it says, as he was praying, heaven was opened. So we pursue, but also disciples make it a habit to pray. Don't don't overcomplicate prayer. Just start doing it. Just with a genuine hunger and a thirst, just start to call out to God. Cultivate that relationship with Him. Every relationship in your life will get better the more that you talk. And your relationship with the Holy Spirit in your life will grow greater and your sensitivity to His voice in your life will become more clear the more that you communicate. Disciples pursue and disciples pray. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just one moment? Holy Spirit, thank you for being present with us today. And just like Aaron even mentioned earlier, this that song that we were singing, talking about your presence filling this place, representing that place of life. That place that we've just find ourselves in right now. We ask that your Holy Spirit would fill the place that we are in right now. God, in this room, there are those that are just, they've got a lot of opportunity, a lot of excitement, a lot of adventure in front of them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill that place with direction, with power, with purpose. God, Lord, there are people in this room right now that they're in a place of just uncertainty. They don't know, they don't even know why they're in this place. And they just want to be out of it. God, show up. Allow them to have a sensitivity to your spirit, I pray. God, all across this room, God, even all of those watching online, There's there's a place that we find ourselves in right now. And we just invite you. Just right where you are, just begin to invite the Holy Spirit. We invite you, Holy Spirit, into the place that we are. God, right where I am, I invite you. Direct me. Fill me with your strength and your power. God, show me the purpose of this season. Certain, the, the purpose of my place. Fill me fresh and anew with your Holy Spirit, I pray. I don't want to do this in my own strength. As you're praying, maybe there's some in this room that you just, you don't have a relationship with Jesus at all. Maybe you're like those disciples that Paul encountered. He's starting to have a conversation with them about the Holy Spirit, but he realizes that they aren't actually following Jesus. Maybe their heart's inclined towards God, but they haven't become a disciple of Jesus. I want to encourage you to take that step and make Jesus the Lord of your life. I want to lead you in a prayer right where you are. Jesus... I give you my life. I surrender all. All my sins, all my hopes and dreams, I place them at the foot of the cross. I believe that it is at the cross that my sins are forgiven. I believe that I'm forgiven by you, Lord. I I give my, my life to you every aspect of it. I put it in your hands for you to lead me, for you to teach me, for you to guide me. Thank you for forgiving me. God, and thank you for the hope of life.
for the hope of life, for this life and for all of eternity, God, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, can we celebrate?